So you, you've interviewed a, a variety of different people, a lot of the highest profile bankers and CEOs and different things of nature. Um, what do you get from the interviews that you do from these highly intelligent, highly successful, highly wealthy people? Like when we interview people, we always, you know, gain information from the interview. It's a great way to actually learn. So what, what are some of the insights and what are some of the things that you, you've walked away from, from some of the, you know, people that you've had conversations with? Huh, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I'm a news guy, right? So I'm always looking for what the news is. I'm always trying to figure out, um, uh, you know, what I can help my viewers with in terms of understanding where the Fed is going, what, you know, what the, how, how to think about the economy. But I guess the thing that's probably the most important thing that I get from these interviews is figuring out how people think about things, how they process information. Mm -hmm. It's a, as you know, I mean, there's so much going on. There's so much to process, but but there are guys that I talk to that are able to, you know, drill down and see past all the confusion and all the the other stuff uh, that's out there and really help you um, uh, see things. I the, one of the things I really like about my job and 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 that I have to remember is is to always be talking to people. Mm -hmm. And never think you really know or understand something because some, you know, I've been a newspaper reporter for a long time. And then I was on, I've been on television and um, I remember once uh, having run a correction for uh, the guy who smelt, who spelled his name Smith, S-M-Y-T-H-E. And I didn't ask him how he spelled it. And that's kind of always been a lesson to me, which is you think you understand a process always um uh always make sure you you got the nuts and bolts right because then a lot of other stuff falls into place so the the best investors i've spoken to the best people i know um, on this stuff are able to cut through the information confusion that's out there not get themselves wound up in in details that don't matter mm. um and and really focus on the questions in front of them rather than the questions they don't need to be spending their time on. Yeah. One of the things that you, you spoke to us about and, and Ian could contest to it was like you, having conversations is important, but I think it was the, the day uh, that we spoke, I think the, the Fed meeting was going to happen uh, the next day. And you said, yeah, I got to, I got to go. Cause I got to be up by four forty-five in the morning to process all the data. <laughs> and so like, we always get the question, all of us get the question of what do you read? How do you, what is your research? So what's that process like for you? Cause at that point, you're like, four, I'm like 445, man, I'm waking up at 536. He's already an hour ahead of me and he's analyzing data at that time. So what is, what is that process like for you as an economist? So um, I read, you know, a couple, trying to think, there, there's some guys who are good on certain things and some who are, who are good on others, but um, I'll read four or five different economic reports that kind of, um, uh show what what the forecast is what's expected um i'll go back and look at the prior data um i'll also kind of write down for myself what other data is similar to what's coming out because you know the government data it's probably good over time but it, it it's just it's not that great sometimes on a on a high frequency basis um and so um for example when a jobs report comes out it it, it has a a 95% confidence level of plus or minus 100,000. What does that mean? It means that, that the number, if you want to be confident that it's right, it can be plus or minus 100,000 of what they're saying it is. So if it's 200,000, it's almost definitely between 100 and 300,000, which is crazy when you think about it, because the market's going to trade on whether or not it was, if the estimate was 200, if it was 220, it's hot. If it's 180, it's low, but the confidence band. So I'm bringing that up because what I'll go into, um, I'll go into the jobs number, which is this Friday, by the way, and the number they're looking for is 275,000. So now you guys will all know that the real confidence level on this thing is, what is it, 175 to 375. Yeah. But I'll know what the jobless claims number is. I'll know what a bunch of survey data is telling me about um, – what the job market is. So that won't be the only piece of information. So this number comes out, and if it's wildly out of sample with all of the other stuff that I'm looking at, 
well, I'll say so on television. And I've done that before where I, I, there was a November number, I think in 2021 that came out really low. And I said, there's no way that that is accurate. I think it was something like it came out at 200,000. And I said, that can't be true. Um, and that number was subsequently revised up to six or 700,000 after it came out. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's really important to kind of know everything that's going on in the economy and for stuff to kind of fit into a general idea that you have of, of how things are going. The other thing that's been really interesting and, 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 and really energizes me is that there's a whole bunch of new uh, private sector high frequency data that's been coming out um, that's now available. The hedge funds are looking at this. Um, you can all look at this. We've been reporting more of this, but there are now companies that, um, for example, they provide human resources software to uh, uh, like tens of thousands of companies. And they're now providing us with what that says about the employment uh, levels that are going on out there. Uh, there's credit card data on a high frequency basis. JP Morgan is putting out now. Um, the Federal Reserve is using this kind of data when, when there's a hurricane uh, in a certain place like there was. The Fed can look at what's happening with consumer spending by zip code using this credit card data. So the world's changing quite a bit. The government's a bit behind it. They're trying to use it, but there's a lot of new data out there and new data sources that are giving us a uh, more of a precise and a more frequent look at what's happening in the economy and ultimately over time should help with making uh, better policy and better investment choices. I have a two-parter for you. Um, you're incredibly passionate about what you do. So what, like, what's your motivation? What's your inspiration? What's your drive? For what do you do? Um, huh. Fire away, please. I'm curious. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I have this like idiot's ability to convince myself that whatever I'm doing at the time is the most important thing in the world. Um, and I, I don't quite know how I do that, but but I, I I truly think that if I'm if you know if if it's a story I'm working on, there's nothing more important than what that, than what I'm doing right now, and. And the fate of the world hangs on it. Um, mm. So I got to be a little careful with that. But but at the end of the day, um, I wake up energized. I think what I do matters. I, I I know that like J.P. Morgan and has a whole bunch of economists, and Citibank has a whole bunch of economists, and and Wells Fargo does. But I go on TV, and I'm kind of like the in-house economist for a lot of small shops and a lot of individual investors, and they kind of rely upon me. So um, I, I, I think what I do is, is, is significant and I have, you know, I really think it's important that I get it right mm -hmm. and as fast as I possibly can. Um, and so, uh, I'm, I'm motivated to get up every day and I have been for something like 20 years at CNBC and, and eight years at the wall street journal before that. That's incredible. Um, and my second part question, um, do you think that this form of extended, quantitative easing is destructive for global markets long term. Yeah, what huh. are you watching the Animal Channel? I see like huh. I know I, I, he had he had, he had flamingos oh, yeah. before he had a bobcat. Yeah. I've been watching like a it. It's like a toy. Trying we're, to keep the retention rates up. Yeah, no, no, we're we're writing down all the animals yeah. that have appeared. <laughs> we're up to a peacock now. Legendary. I was watching to get the peacock. No Legendary. mating though. No, no, no that was that Even was fun. You you should leave it on. It's kind of like, you know, if people are interested in my answer, they can at least watch the animal channel behind it. <laughs> um, but um, I, the way I'd answer your question is, I think that the Fed intervening in markets and and being so involved and 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 jumping in so much, I think it's distorting markets. I think that it's, it's like it's like anything, you know. Getting in is easy; getting out is tough. I mean. Um, the, the Fed just got out too late this time. It probably got out too late before that. Then again, I think the getting in was right. Like in 08 and 09, I think that they, you know, probably saved the world from a terrible, terrible meltdown, you know? Um, but I think they probably hung around too long. Um, and then, and I think they didn't reverse policy quick enough. Um, and then this time around, they got in, I think, you know, it, Whatever you want to complain about what the government did in the pandemic or what the Fed did, it's you should remember this. When this pandemic hit, 
the debate we were having in economic circles was whether or not the unemployment rate was going to be worse than the Great Depression or equal to it. True. So I'm saying that by reminding folks that um, uh, they helped avoid a much worse situation than we could have had. The economy didn't crack or came back very quickly from where it was. Um, employment level started coming back. Questions about whether or not you know we had these different waves come through, um, and 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 also well to point out from the Federal Reserve standpoint, they began thinking that the pandemic was going to hurt demand. It was going to hurt consumers. They didn't think that the government was going to come in with as much assistance as they did. The government almost is always too late with everything. This time around, they were not. There was bipartisan consensus. Democrats and Republicans got together, put money in people's pockets. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that uh, Biden gets all the blame for the $1.9 trillion that he put in, but Trump put in $6 trillion or, or $5 trillion. So the blame ought to be shared is my point on both sides. Um, uh, you know, I think Biden could have been a little more, uh, um, a, a little smaller and more direct with what he did. That being the case, I think the Fed could have also backed off. So yeah, it's de I think you ask a great question. It is destabilizing. The Fed is in in a big way. And then the reason is because they have to come out and the, and, and the getting out is what's going to be a complicated situation. And, and you should tell people that what the Fed is doing now, it came in, it was buying 120 billion a month. Now it's going to let $95 billion a month roll off its balance sheet, and that's going to kind of disappear. So far, so good with that process, but it's a little uncertain how it all ends up. This, this day, Red Panda Anthem. Ian, what's up? This day, Red Panda Anthem. Red Panda, what's this good? Day, Red Panda Anthem. <laughs> Your boy. Going up. I know they can't stand it.